Good afternoon, men. Let me invite you to open your Bibles to Psalm 44. We'll be in Psalm 44 this evening. When I was asked to speak at chapel, I was polarized with indecision about my passage. Throughout the past 12 years that I have been gone from Los Angeles, I've kept a mental note of passages I would like to preach at the Master Seminary Chapel. And yet when invited, I could remember none of them. And so I've settled on what I preached uh, last Lord's Day at my own church, and I hope it'll be an encouragement uh, to you. It is a difficult passage to preach, um, and so I hope, in a sense, to encourage you to tackle difficult passages. Let me pray before we begin. God, we are, again, grateful, thankful for Daniel's testimony and uh, your work in his life, and we pray now uh, for our time in your word. We pray that your word would encourage us. It would conform us to the image of Christ. We haven't seen Christ, and yet you have called us to be conformed to his image. And so we know that takes a bit of a mini miracle. It takes your spirit working in our heart to shape us and mold us into the image of the one we haven't seen. Though we haven't seen him, we do love him. And so we pray that your word this morning would help conform us to the love of Christ. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Well... What kind of song would you expect somebody to write if that person saw their parents struck down by God? What kind of music would you expect someone to compose if that person saw the ground open up and swallow his family because of how they approached God in worship? The sons of Korah were hymn writers, to be sure, and Psalm 44 is one of their hymns. In fact, they wrote 10 psalms. Uh, This is probably the most quintessential of them. It captures what it means to be a psalm of the sons of Korah, certainly as well as any of the other ones. And it's helpful to remember the history of Korah and where this line came from. Korah was in the wilderness with Moses. Korah had crossed the the Red Sea. He had been led out of slavery in Egypt. He had seen the waters spread. He had seen the Egyptians swallowed. He had eaten manna. He saw a Sabbath breaker in Numbers 15 executed for breaking the Sabbath. And when Moses was teaching after that execution, Moses was teaching on things that were I mean, almost kind of random between dress and, and the, the side of your hair and the clothing. And it was that category of instruction Moses was giving. Korah interrupted him. This is described in number 16. Korah interrupted him and said, basically, who are you, Moses, that keeps making yourself out to be godlier than everybody else? Don't you know, Moses, that we all cross the Red Sea We all eat the same manna. We all have experienced God in the same way. Why do you think you're godlier than everybody else? Can't we all have an equal approach to Yahweh? That's that's Korah's question. Korah was related to Levi. He's from the tribe of Levi. And he wanted access to God in the tabernacle. He said, why can't we all offer incense? Now, there were others with Korah. Of course, I'm sure you remember the story. There's others that were named. There was a total of 250 people that participated in this rebellion. And Moses, I mean, I'll summarize number 16, basically with this. Moses said, you want to offer incense to Yahweh? Show up tomorrow. Bring your incense, bring your golden censer, and let's see what happens. And they did. They brought their families. They gathered outside the tabernacle. The voice of Yahweh spoke to Moses, first of all, and said, separate yourself from them because they're going down. Moses removed himself. And then Yahweh said this, to prove to you that I am who I say I am, if these people die of old age, I'm not God. If they die in a way that has ever before been seen, I'm not the covenant God of Israel. And then fire came out from the tabernacle and the ground opened up, destroying 250 of these men and their households. And it appears to mean that their their whole houses were caved in. This was a selective wrath. Wherever they were dwelling in the the mass of people, their homes were swallowed up, their families were swallowed up. But 1 Chronicles lets you know that their children survived. God let their children live to be a testimony of Yahweh's mercy his precise judgment. 
That's going to color the way you worship Yahweh. The descendants of Korah did indeed worship Yahweh. They grew up. They followed Joshua across the Red Sea. They marched around the walls of Jericho. When David was hiding in the wilderness with Saul, the sons of, uh, from Saul, the sons of Korah were there with him. When David was sent into exile, the sons of Korah went with him. When Absalom overthrew him, the sons of Korah were with David. They, in a very real sense, would rather be gatekeepers in the true king's house than prime ministers in the false king. First Chronicles 26 lets you know that Solomon made them gatekeepers of the temple. And you want a dictionary definition of irony. That's about as close as you're going to get right there. Their line started by approaching Yahweh in an inappropriate way, and it will end with them being literal gatekeepers to the temple. Second Chronicles tells you they begin writing hymns. I'm not suggesting the ones who wrote Psalm 44 were the children or even the grandchildren of Korah himself, as much as it is this line was so important to them. You might not know your great-grandfather's name. I'll tell you, the sons of Korah did. They knew exactly who they were. They know who they were from. They knew the God that they worshiped, and they worshiped God over every obstacle, knowing that the source of this, the source of their whole family identity comes to that day where God opened up a pit and swallowed their forefather. What kind of psalm would you write if that was your legacy? Let me read Psalm 44 for you. And you can't help but know the story of Korah as you're reading this psalm and just see how it colors it. To the choir, master and maskal of the sons of Korah. Oh God, we have heard with our ears and our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. With you, your own hand drove out the nations, but you, but them you planted. You afflicted the people, but them you set free. For not by their own sword did they win the land, nor did their own arm save them, but your right hand and your arm and the light of your face, for you delighted in them. You're my king, O God. Ordain salvation for Jacob. Through you, we push down our foes. Through your name, we tread down those who rise up against us. For not in my own bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me, but you have saved us from our foes and have put to shame those who hate us. In God, we have boasted continually and we will give thanks to your name forever. Selah. But you've rejected us and disgraced us. You haven't gone out with our armies. You've made us turn back from the foe and those who hate us have gotten the spoil. You've made us like sheep for slaughter and have scattered us among the nations. You have sold your people for a trifle, demanding not even a high price for them. You've made us the taunt of our neighbors, the derision and scorn of those around us. You've made us a byword among the nations, a laughingstock among the peoples. All day long, my disgrace is before me and shame has covered my face at the sound of the taunter and the reviler at the sight of the enemy and the avenger. All this has come upon us, even though we have not forgotten you. We haven't been false to your covenant. Our heart hasn't turned back, nor have our steps departed from your ways. Yet you've broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, wouldn't, wouldn't God discover this? Because he knows the secrets of the heart. Yet for your sake, we are killed all day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Awake, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Don't reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly clings to the ground. Rise up. Come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. I mean, in one sense, there is no psalm like this in the Bible. This is really unparalleled in its anguish towards God. There's nothing else like it. This is a psalm for rainy days, and I was studying last week for this passage, and 
there was a flood warning and I, I heard the rain starting to fall and beating on the house and my yard flooded and our, my trampoline moved and just water through everywhere and the water receded and there's just debris everywhere. Reading Psalm 44 is like that. It starts pounding on your head and then it feels like it sweeps you away. But when the water finally recedes, you're almost left with nothing to stand on. There's really not a lot of hope at the end of this psalm. It's an oscillating psalm in many ways. It goes from past to, to present. It starts with past victories the Lord has given them. Oh, he's heard them. There's a little sense of distance in there. I've heard of these. I was told these. But then he makes that present tense by saying, I believe these myself. And then it just peters out, just disperses. It's an oscillating psalm in terms of who is singing it. It appears to be antiphonal. It appears to be a call and response. The pronouns change. I, we, I, we. I have heard what God does and the congregation sings, we have heard what God does. I believe God is true and the congregation sings, we believe God is true. And yet I'm abandoned by God and the congregation sings, we are abandoned by God. The pronouns are about equally split. Clearly this is a psalm of lament but it's not like any other psalm of lament. I mean, the classic dictionary definition of a psalm of lament is a psalm that laments your present circumstances, but produces faithfulness and worship in God. And most psalms of lament start that way. Most psalms of lament start with, how long, O Lord? Or, or why do you tarry, God? Or why are enemies triumphing? But they end with prayer and they end with praise. Not this psalm. I mean, this psalm has has three stanzas in it, and it starts with the goodness of God. It ends with the question. The question, by the way, is why are you sleeping, O Lord? That's the question here. Does it end with praise? Well, it's kind of a prayer, I guess, but the prayer is really, it comes across as yelling at God. Why do you hide your face? That's the lament of this psalm. This is a psalm that is a conundrum for people. To study, it's not, it's in book two. I'm preaching through book two of the Psalter right now in, in Emmanuel. And book two is not, it's not like the rest of the Psalms. It's, you know, technically it's the Elohim portion of the Psalter. God's covenant name is few and far between. David refers to God as Yahweh all the time. Book two is kind of what this Psalm said. Did you, did you forget our name? I mean, we didn't forget your name. And yet this whole book is missing God's covenant name for the most part. And you see that in this psalm. We didn't forget your name, Elohim. It's a dark book, Psalm 2 is. And perhaps that's because of Psalm 44. It was Emily Dickinson who said that pain is masked by praise. And that's an insightful observation by the poet there. But it's an observation that when you hear it, you want to argue with it. I do. The theologian in me hears somebody say that pain is covered up or missed or masked by praise. And I want to say, no, no, not really. You see, pain has a way of, our praise has a way of magnifying your pain and displaying that you view the, you know, the, the, the glories of God as, as better than whatever suffering you're going through. And that's a way of like actually magnifying your, 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 the way you view God through your pain. So, so worship doesn't mask pain in a sense it rightly orders it and so I have like a theological definition I would use on an ordination exam if somebody asked me uh, what's the relationship between worship and suffering I have an answer that would pass muster and yet in the secrets of my heart I still think there is a very real sense in which pain is masked by praise and it's the story of the sons of Korah the psalm as a whole is tragic and I I've mentioned a few times that it's a, it's a dark psalm, but this is what grabbed my heart. I was reading a, a Jewish commentary on, on something totally unrelated by a guy named Herbert Levine. His book is Sing Unto God a New Song. He's a, he's a contemporary Jewish scholar. He's not a believer that I know of. And he declares in his book that Psalm 44 is one of the most significant psalms in Jewish history. He, he refers to it as one of the most quoted psalms by the Jews, and they hold on to it in times of genocide and holocaust. It's a psalm that is often quoted by people who are being put to death for their, their Jewish identity. He has this quote in there. He says, the irony of Psalm 44 is that it is most often quoted by its victims. People who lost their lives because they believed it. I've never heard anybody describe somebody 
as a victim for believing the psalm. But if you read Psalm 44, you know what he means. I mean, just in the Jewish mindset here, there's a very foundational question as they're going through the history of the, of the Jews from, from Holocaust to genocide. It's a very foundational question as a Jew is going through that. Is God aware of their suffering? Is God aware of what's happening to them? And that's a yes or no question. It's a binary question. If you were to ask somebody going through a genocide or going through a Holocaust, does God know what you're going through? It is there's not room for gradation there. It's a yes or no. If the answer is no, I mean, why bother with the Bible? If the answer is yes, that produces a whole slew of other questions. How do you say God's aware of all that the suffering we're going through, and yet here we are? As I outline Psalm 44, I begin with the first eight or so verses that I would call good people. The psalm begins by the declaration of good people. These, the sons of Korah, are good people. And again, I know the phrase good people can be like petting the cat backwards here. It can get your, your, your hair up. You know, nobody is good except God alone. You know, if somebody comes up to you and says at, at a Q&A uh, at your church or somebody in the hallway says, why do bad things happen to good people? I know that you can't help yourself. You can't help yourself, can you? There is no one who's good. Everybody gets what they deserve. We, if you have the sunshine on you for five more seconds. That's more than you deserve. There is no such thing as good people. And I understand that answer from an apologetic standpoint. That's a very effective answer when a non-believer asks you about that or when somebody's asking a question about a non-believer. There is no such thing as good people. That's a very helpful answer for apologetics to get somebody to aware of their own sin. Jesus uses that. I'm not critiquing that. It's just not what Psalm 44 does. Psalm 44 is operating the category that there are, is a category of good in the world and a category of bad in the world. And all those pagan nations that, that worship rocks and sticks and stones, they're bad. And, you know, they kill their kids and they, you know, plunder everybody. They're bad. And those people that believe Yahweh and hold fast to his covenant and are gatekeepers in the temple and write Psalms and go with, into exile with David, that that's a good thing to do. And they're in a good category. And this Psalm, the first paragraph says, is written by the good guys. And he says, we're good. I've heard with our ears, our fathers have told us all the things you did, how you afflicted the people in verse two. But verse four, you are my king. He appropriates it for himself. You are my king, God. Through you, we push down our foes. The psalmist doesn't boast in himself. He knows everything he has comes from the hand of the Lord. He's, he's got... Good theology, in other words, which you would expect in the Bible. He doesn't trust himself. He says, I, I believe in God. I know what my parents taught me, and I believe it. Uh, we wa marched around Jericho. We saw the walls fall. Look at, look at verse 3. It wasn't their own sword that they did this. It wasn't our, our ancestors who defeated those in Jericho. It was God who did this. We under, the psalmist says, I understand this. It's God who gives the victory. It's God who leads us into victory. And he says, I don't trust myself. He's a rightly... Ordered anthropology here. He says in verse six, I don't trust my own bow. My own sword can't save me. I don't trust myself, he's saying. These are all the right answers. I believe God. I don't trust myself. I boast only in the name of God. That's his testimony. This would be a different psalm if he started by saying, I'm a wretched sinner. I've rejected your covenant and now I'm dealing with the consequences, but that's not where this starts. It starts with him declaring that he is essentially a good person. That's where he starts. But from there, he moves to bad things in verse nine. Bad things, you've rejected us, he says. You've rejected us. Now, I don't know what he's talking about. We don't know when exactly this psalm was written. Was it written after the ground swallowed Korah? Was it written when David was exiled by Absalom? Was it written in some, uh, some commentators suggest it was written some unknown military defeat David suffered. It's not recorded elsewhere in the Bible, but lives on through Psalm 44. Who knows? Was it written when the Assyrians took the Israelites into captivity? It would fit with that. Is it written when the Babylonians destroyed the temple? It would fit with that. Was it written when Ezra brings everybody back and sees them intermarrying and he's pulling out his beard and weeping and thinks all Israel is lost. They can't find Levites anywhere. It would fit with that. 
It would fit when the temple was desecrated under Antiochus IV. It would fit with that. Obviously, it was written before then, but it fits with that just fine. It fits with the destroying of the temple in 70 AD. It fits with the plundering of Jerusalem. It fits with every holocaust and genocide the Jews go through. That's the point of the psalm. It always fits with their defeats. It always fits. It's terrible things that are happening to them. That's the point. He says in verse 10, you made us retreat. You gave everything that we had. You gave it away. You made us like sheep for the slaughter. Verse 12, you sold your people for a trifle. Uh, The psalmist visualizes them on the auction block with God saying, who who will bid for the Israelites? Do I hear a dollar? And somebody says a dollar and God says sold. And they're on the auction block saying, "Can't, can't you hold that for more? Aren't we worth more than a dollar? Aren't we worth more than a trifle? And, you know, they're, they're weeping for what's happening to them, but they're also weeping because it's, it's letting people make fun of the Lord. They say in verse 14, you've made us a byword among the nations. Everybody is mocking them. Their disgrace in verse 15 is before them. This is terrible things that are happening to them. And they don't have a grid to explain it. This leads to the why. If I would describe the the first paragraph, it would be good people. The second paragraph would be bad things. And the third paragraph would be why. That's the question in the Psalm. Verse 17, all this has come upon us, though we have not forgotten you. That's the key phrase here. This has happened to them even though they haven't forgotten the Lord. Again, if somebody came to you and said, all these terrible things are happening to me, And because of that, I'm walking away from the faith. Or they came to you and said, my dad, who went to Sunday school every day, raised me to, you know, an Awana. I got the trophy and everything. And, you know, when my mom died of cancer, my dad said, that's it. I give up on God. I'm out. We have a category for that. We can reason through that as as pastors. We, you know, we have a category that God uses trials to sanctify the church and to purify the church and to separate the wheat from the tares. And they went out from us because they were never of us. And, you know, it's a hard truth to swallow when somebody is leading you in the Lord your, your, your whole growing up. But, you know, this is just the reality that God is purifying a church that way. Like we have that answer. But Psalm 44 is not that kind of question. In Psalm 44, he says, I'm not going anywhere. I'm still holding on to the Lord. You see how that's almost a harder question to answer? Why are so many terrible things happening to me when I still believe in the Lord? It's like the Lord has done everything to get rid of me, but I'm not going anywhere. That's the psalmist's testimony. For that reason, the suffering in the psalm, it's not punishment for any kind of sin. It's just a question mark. It's got to remind you of Job as you read this psalm. You know, Job had so many wicked and terrible things happen to him, his family all, all killed and he loses everything that his friends, when his friends ask him, you know, you have, God wouldn't let something like this happen unless you had done something massively wrong, Job. And Job, of course, says, I didn't sell anybody into slavery. I didn't, I paid my workers wages. I don't have any secret sin. I just don't know why it's happening. That's Psalm 44. If there was secret sin that they had committed that perhaps could be explained. And that's of course a good place to start when you're examining why you're going through trials. It's helpful to ask yourself, is this sanctifying me? Is this exposing some sin in my own heart? I didn't know about And the answer is likely yes. And is that why you're going through the trial? Not necessarily, but that's always a good place to start. But it doesn't match up with what this psalmist is going through here. He just, he's looking at his heart and he's like, certainly there's flaws in him. He doesn't trust himself. He's already confessed that, but nothing that would explain this. He says in verse 20, if I had walked away from the covenant, certainly God would know about this. Verse 20, he knows the secrets of my heart in verse 21. Of course he would know, but he can't explain They should be experiencing Joseph's tears of joy and being God's covenant people. And instead they have Rachel's tears of weeping and they don't know why. So why do you order the Psalm backwards? As I mentioned, this is a lament Psalm and it goes backwards. You can outline it backwards. Good people, bad things. Why make it the English order? Why do bad things happen to good people? That's the question the psalm asks, and it backs into it like the psalm does everything else. Why do bad things happen to good people? 
there's some bad guesses for that answer. There's bad answers to that, to that question. Certainly there are. One bad answer would be because God can't control it. Maybe God's sleeping, God doesn't know. The psalmist toys with that answer in verse 23, doesn't he? Awake, God. Why are you sleeping, O Lord? He addresses the Lord that way. Why are you sleeping? Does the psalmist actually think God is sleeping? I don't think so. If he worshiped the kind of God that took naps, he probably wouldn't be writing Psalm 44. I feel like that bridge was crossed a long time ago with the sons of Korah. They figured out who Yahweh is. He doesn't really think God is sleeping. Why do people suggest that? I mean, they're looking for some answer. I very vividly remember as a new believer, I'd been a Christian only a few years, and I was teaching at a Christian high school. And there was a, another girl who went to my same church. Sarah was her name. She wanted to be a missionary in Central America. She was a substitute teacher at the school. She had, was a graduate of the school, and we were in college together. And so we're, you know, we're fresh out of the school. All the students know her, knew her, wanted to be a missionary, and she got killed by a drunk driver. And this is before social media and cell phone days. And so there had to be a way to tell all the students that Sarah was killed by a drunk driver. And so chaplain brought all the students into the gym and wheeled in a whiteboard into the gym. And he wrote on the whiteboard the following, God, and then he did an equal sign, God equals love. Love equals choices. Choices equals results. And he says, God can't violate this drunk driver's freedom to make choices that have these results. Did God know Sarah was going to die? Of course he knew, but he couldn't stop it without violating this drunk driver's freedom to make choices. And if God violated this drunk driver's freedom to make choices, he'd be violating his own love, and God can't violate his own love. I had been a believer just a few years at this point didn't have theology. I didn't know what a John MacArthur was at that point. <laughs> I'm looking at this whiteboard wheeled out in the gym floor and think, that's, that's terrible. I mean, that's just terrible. That God knew about it but couldn't stop it because of his commitment to love, which means choices to kill other people. That doesn't make any sense. If you think about that kind of thing for 10 seconds, it just unravels completely. Why would somebody say that kind of thing? I mean, it's so obviously bad. Why would somebody say it? And I don't want to harp on this guy who said it, the chaplain. He's a broken dude. He knew the guy who died. I mean, he's dealing with his own grief. He's just trying to communicate to a room full of people that hadn't experienced a loss like that before, that God is still good. In a sense, he's trying to defend God. God is still good, even though this is really, really bad. Let's just go from there. And the psalmist toys with that, doesn't he? You roll your eyes at it, but the psalmist toys at it with it in verse 23. Awake, why are you sleeping, O Lord? It just doesn't make any sense that God would be sleeping. He's not the kind of God who sleeps. He's not the God of Baal or the God of the Amalekites or whatever. God's not asleep. It doesn't make any sense that God would reject his covenant people forever. It doesn't make any sense. God doesn't forget our affliction and our oppression. It may seem like that. It seems like that particularly to believers sometimes. First Peter chapter four, what, verse 17, judgment begins with the household of God. That's just the reality. We experience God's purging. We experience God's judgment. We experience suffering and in a very personal way. And of course, non-Christians and people outside of God's covenant experience wrath all the time, but they don't write Psalms about it, <laughs> at least not the kind that we would read. There's a very real sense that God's judgment begins with the household of God. And so you have to work through why. Why does God purge his people like this? Why do God's people go through such suffering? Well, Psalm 44 doesn't give you an answer. It doesn't give you the right answer. It leaves with maybe he's asleep. The psalm is over. And we recognize the Bible doesn't end in Psalm 44. And hopefully when we read this psalm, you dialed into a very powerful New Testament use of Psalm 44. 
you can turn your Bibles to where the New Testament engages Psalm 44. I'm guessing how many people know where it is based upon the pages I hear. Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, Paul enters into this in verse 18. I consider the sufferings of this present time not worth comparing to the glory that's to be revealed in us. That's the fact that Paul starts with. The sufferings of this era not worth comparing to the glory revealed in us. What glory is, is he talking about? As you go through Romans 8, It's clear he's talking about the resurrection. He's talking about our union with Christ. There's progressive sanctification in this life, of course, but Paul's eyes aren't focused on progressive sanctification in this life. He's dialed in here on on martyrdom. He's dialed in here on, on death, that he's going to die and the present sufferings of this age aren't even worth comparing to that. And he's gonna die in, you know, graphic way. His head cut off, of disciples will die crucified upside down. Martyrs will be lined up and beheaded throughout church history. That's what he's talking about here. And he's referring to it with this kind of language of the sufferings of this present time. It's a very foreign language to us as Americans because we don't generally engage with suffering like this. We don't generally engage with suffering corporately like Psalm 44 is written. You know, we, we just are in a different world. We have... Two cars, you know, which car did you drive to seminary today? And, you know, maybe you're, you're in a one-car family through seminary knowing that two cars will be around the corner. Like, that's our trial in life right now. It's so trivial, honestly. And that's not to say we don't have suffering now, but our suffering in this life tends to be very individualistic, like cancer, uh, a spouse leaving, a child rebelling. Uh, those kind of trials are the very individualistic ways that we're wrestling with this. And so the solution gets often individualized. That's not really the way that, that Paul is dealing in Romans 8. He's not talking necessarily about cancer, although it certainly applies. He's talking about Christians getting lined up and getting killed one after another, that God is building his church through the blood of the martyrs. Over and over and over again, Christians are dying. This has Psalm 44 echoes to it, that that it seems like they've been forgotten. And yet there's a resurrection on the other side. It doesn't mean that you deserve your suffering. It doesn't mean that Christians die because of their own sin. It, It means that God is building the church that way by preparing Christians for eternity at just the most basic level. Let me just explain it in the most basic way I can. You cannot resurrect unless you first die. Jesus experiences it this way. Jesus has to go through the suffering in order to be resurrected. He has to endure the cross. He has to be humiliated, stripped down, raised up on the cross, mocked and just ridiculed by everybody. He even declares in the cross echoes of Psalm, I know he's quoting Psalm 22, but echoes of Psalm 44, doesn't he? With my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the same way, the author of Psalm 44 doesn't believe that God is actually asleep. You can't deduce from that, although I've read people who've tried, that Jesus really thinks the Father has forgotten he was there. You know, the Father in heaven didn't forget where his son is, didn't, you know, forget he was on the cross bearing the wrath of the sins of that God was pouring out at him. He didn't forget that, of course not. And yet that's the claim that comes out of Jesus' mouth, the cry that comes out of his mouth. Why have you forsaken me? In order for him to be resurrected, he has to first die. There is no crown without the cross. There is no resurrection without death. And that is what is in the background of Psalm 44, but not fully worked out. But Paul claims it in verse 18, the sufferings of this life are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed in us. He works through this on display in nature as nature longs for its redemption, the new heavens and the new earth. He works down in verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? He ties that to Jesus, that the father gave his own son. He didn't spare him, but gave him. So of course he'll graciously give us all things just as the son received all things. I think speaking of death and resurrection. In light of that, can anything separate us from the love of God? If martyrdom can't separate you from the love of God, can anything else? It's an argument from the greater to the lesser. If martyrdom doesn't strip you away from God's blessings, can anything else? He goes to the resurrection in verse 34. Can Christ Jesus, 
Could he condemn you? Of course not. He's the one who died, and more than that, the one who was raised. Paul is laser focused here on this idea of death and martyrdom producing resurrection. He's now at the right hand of God. He's interceding for us. In light of that, can anything separate you from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. All things, by the way, when you go through that list, all things that Jesus faced, all things that he faced. And it couldn't separate him from the love of the Father. And it's there that Paul quotes in verse 36. For your sake, we are being killed all the day long. Romans is the most New Testament book in the New Testament. And Romans 8 is about as New Testament-y as you get. And he caps it before he transitions to Jacob and he saw an election. He caps Romans 8 with Psalm 44. This cry of anguish. But it's colored differently here, isn't it? In light of the resurrection of Christ, it's colored so differently. For your sake, Lord, we are being killed every day. Every day Christians will die. And it's so foreign to us. It's got to change our calculus of what it means to follow God. It's, it's, so in, it's the antithesis of so much of the American, Americanized health, wealth, prosperity, even by people who would know health, wealth, prosperity, and Joel Steen, all that bad. I know that's bad. And yet you are so easily fall into it with, I love God, and I teach my family to love God, and we go to church, and you know, we, we're doing everything that we can. Certainly there's some measure of blessing that we should be experiencing, such as that when we're not, we start to ask some pretty hard questions like, why not? Aren't I doing everything I'm supposed to do? You wouldn't articulate that with a health, wealth, prosperity kind of language, but you feel it when suffering comes. You feel it, and it's so individualistic in our own culture too, and yet you still feel it. And you wonder... And this has got to change the calculus where you, you recognize you're not following Jesus to experience his blessings any more than the author of Psalm 44 was following, following Yahweh to have victory in battles. He's not having victory in battles. And yet he says, he practically quotes Romans 8 in Psalm 44. I know it goes the other way chronologically, but he practically does. When he tells God, I'm not going anywhere, God. You can try to get rid of me all you want. I'm still here. Nothing's going to separate me from the love of God that I'm experiencing through, through his promises in Psalm 44. Even all of the defeats I'm facing, I'm still here. There are certainly times in the believer's life where covenant faithfulness is married to defeat and suffering. It just seems that way. And unless you can recalibrate it through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you won't have an answer. And that's exactly what Paul does. He takes that cry of despair from Psalm 44, recalibrates it in light of the resurrection of Christ. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. You can't read that without thinking of the, the, great, the great sheep. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Paul can declare in these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. We're so quick to doubt God's goodness and his kindness to us. We're so quick to wonder, is God aware of what we're going through? We're so quick to make excuses for God. Explain why he couldn't stop what we're going through. It's helpful for me to fall back on the promise. The worst thing that can happen, it sounds hackneyed, but the worst thing that can happen to you only produces resurrection. And everything else just focuses in light of that. And like I began by saying, if somebody's going through suffering, has got aware of it or not, it's a binary choice. When you die, do you believe you'll open your eyes in heaven and see the Lord face to face. It's a binary choice. It's yes or no. If no, but if yes, that's gotta shape everything else. 
and give you the courage to stand through persecution and not fear. God, we're grateful that your word energizes us to be courageous. Lord, help focus the things of this world in light of the resurrection. We want to see beyond what's in front of us. We want to see beyond the suffering in this life. We know you're not sleeping. We know sometimes it could feel that way. We know you don't forget your covenant promises, and we know sometimes it can feel that way. Sort of anchor our hearts into the next life because Christ is risen. We long for that day. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.